So uh, welcome to this episode of Group Thinkers. I'm your host, Justin McCord, and with me, as always, is Ronnie Richard. Uh, Ronnie, our guest today was just sharing uh, that in College Park, Maryland, where, where he's located, that it's, it's hot outside, and I don't know where it's not hot. It's across the country. I'm just check my watch. It's 100 here, and it's, I think, if I remember right, it's our 10th straight 100 degree day in Texas. So yeah, it's a little toasty. It's a little, a little toasty. It's, uh, I, I, was, I was in the car a moment ago and I regret being in the car, just mostly from the walk, from parking the car in my garage to the door. You know, not that it's, it's not far, it's less than 10 feet, but it's still like that little moment was miserable uh, in terms of the heat outside, but we're gonna get through it. We're gonna get through it. Uh, we're going to stay hydrated, and we're going to have a fascinating conversation with our guest today from the Do Good Institute and the University of Maryland. We've got Nathan Dietz with us. Nathan, how are you? I'm pretty good. Uh, thank you, Justin. Thank you, Ronnie. But, uh, but I think the first thing I should do is apologize, because when I said it was hot out, I meant that it was 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So, <laughs> you know, it's not... I, I, I can't really, uh, it doesn't really compare to what you've been going through, but it's, well, it's summertime. You know, listen, we, we appreciate the empathy. Uh, you've got greater humidity there in the College Park area. Well, and, yeah. And uh, and so all things being equal, it, it is, it's hot everywhere. And so, uh, but you're so kind to be so empathetic out of the gate. That's not going to make our questions any easier for you. <laughs> uh, that's too bad. Well, anyway, <laughs> yeah. I'm still looking forward to this. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're thrilled that uh, that we could have this this chat today. So uh, just to kind of frame it for our our listeners, you know, Group Thinkers is the podcast from our Giddy Group where on each and every episode we dig into an aspect of uh, nonprofit marketing and fundraising, and uh, and we are joined by someone who has a unique perspective on an angle of something that's happening in the nonprofit marketing landscape. And, uh, and Nathan, as a, a guest, it's, it's wonderful to have you. Uh, Ronnie and I have just finished a series of conversations on the, uh, the idea of digital advancement. Uh, and so over the last number of months, we've been talking with folks about what that means, how to move ahead, uh, digitally, as many times nonprofits find themselves either behind or trying to advance digitally in their marketing and fundraising. And so uh, that sort of evolved into a uh, just a desire on our part to unpack uh, some things that are happening in the world around us. And, uh, and in particular, to talk about some uh, current trends from the Giving USA research and uh, the ideas around the recession. And so there are some uncertainties that are about, this is the first of a series of conversations about uncertainty that we're going to have. And, uh, and so we appreciate you being on uh, what we would say is the first episode of a new season uh, for, for us talking about uncertainty and the nonprofit landscape. And we know that we're not going to leave with uh, certainty, <laughs> you know, uh, but we, what we want to do is just dig in and understand the complexities around nonprofit finances and around, uh, from your perspective, the research that, that you and the team at the Do Good Institute have, have put in place. Uh, because as you said, um, you, you're quite accustomed to talking about nonprofit finances. Mm -hmm. and so we're, we're excited to have you. Uh, thank you so much for making the time. If you would, like, just give us a, you know, talk about your background. Let's start there, and and let's start with your your current role at the Do Good Institute, and uh, and and what exactly you do there. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, let's let we should probably start there at the Do Good Institute. I'm um, a senior researcher and an associate research professor, uh, which, and like the titles imply, my main job is to do research on philanthropy. Uh, civic engagement, giving to charities, uh, volunteering. We do a lot of work there, and uh, I'll explain why in, in a minute. 
but I also teach nonprofit finance to uh, the nonprofit professionals mainly in the area. And uh, that's the, I'll draw on a lot of that as we go along today talking about uh, the effects of the Great Recession. Before I came to the university, I was with the Urban Institute Center on Nonprofits and Philanthropy. Um, and there is where I worked on some research projects uh, with the National Center for Charitable Statistics talking about the effects of the Great Recession. Uh, the, the first little research reports that talked about the immediate effects of the Great Recession of the late 2000s on the nonprofit sector. And uh, following up on that, uh, right before the pandemic, uh, Ruth McCambridge from the Nonprofit Quarterly contacted me. This was, you know, a couple years after I came over to the university full time. She said, would you be interested in doing a, an article with me for the Nonprofit Quarterly on a 10 year retrospective of the, on the Great Recession and its impact on the sector's finances? Uh, because, you know, what, what her claim was, and I think she was right, uh, everybody thought the sky was going to fall when the Great Recession hit in the nonprofit sector. There would be a mass extinction episode. Tons of nonprofits would uh, would have terminal financial conditions and never recover from that. And uh, you know, people were people were terribly worried about it. Ten years after the recession ended and the recovery started, you can almost not even tell that the recession even happened. So uh, she wanted to write about that, and I thought. That's a great idea. So we did some uh, we did some research. We published the article, and then the pandemic hit, <laughs> and it made us all wonder about everything uh, that we were worried about, that people were worried about when it came to the Great Recession, uh, plus many other uh, very scary unknown factors, and no one knew what kind of impact those were going to have on the sector. So uh, between then and now, I've been working on a, a couple of research projects, but it was really interesting to go back and revisit the work that we did for that article for NPQ, uh, because so much time has passed. It seems like, you know, we've been through several different worlds uh, since early 2020. And uh, um, and talking about the uncertainty uh, of, uh, in the sector's uh, finances, I think uh, I think now is a great time to do it because there's not much less uncertainty than there was in March 2020 when this article came out. And that article is is what brought us to you. Uh, that's actually the the prompt. So I understand. Yeah. Yeah. As as Ronnie and I were thinking about and talking with members of of the RKD team about, man, there is there is so much uncertainty, and it's become something that is, uh, it's laboring. On uh, on nonprofit decision makers, you know, pressure from their CFOs, pressure from the board, uh, complexities around the supply chain, just the general uncertainty of health and wellness tied to the pandemic. All of these different stressors have uh, have added up, and and now we are in this season where we maybe more than ever feel like we don't know what's going to happen next. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the mm -hmm. war-torn mentality of having ran the marathon that we have for the last two plus years. And uh, looking at inflation and looking at the potential recession. And uh, I got to tell you, out of the gate, our uh, I uh, took comfort in much of what that article had to say, and we'll be sure to link to the article in the in the show notes, et cetera. Uh, I, I did take much comfort in what that article had to say because I do believe that there are learnings from when we walk through similar-ish patterns in the past that we can draw from. Uh, but it it doesn't look exactly like today. So that's where we're wrestling with these things and, and why we're, we're glad you're here as an expert on nonprofit uh, finances. So, so really, uh, I guess the burning question is, should nonprofits be worried about inflation and the possibility of a recession? Well, I, I think that all nonprofit organizations, just like all, all people, should be worried about uh, the effects of inflation. But, you know, given what we've all experienced so far and the possibility that a recession is coming down the pike. I mean, I wish we, uh, like like us, I, I'm not sure that nonprofit organizations individually can do much about uh, prepare, uh, not, certainly not forestalling the, whatever outcome is going to happen. And I think there's only so much you could do to prepare for it. 
uh, given the given where we are right now. Um, but I think that uh, I mean I, I think that it's it should be an area of concern because uh, because of everything that we've seen so far. Uh, the 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 thing about this though, the, one of the first things to keep in mind is that uh, the recession, just like it does, just like it hits uh, the the wealthy people uh, much differently than it hits people who are not very wealthy and who are already who've already experienced a lot of economic dislocation. The same is true for organizations in the nonprofit sector. The very wealthiest, largest organizations are going to have a much different experience and probably uh, you know suffer a lot less harm. Than smaller nonprofit organizations will. So that's something to keep in mind as you're reading this article, especially because we're looking at aggregate totals across subsectors and across the entire sector of dollars. And when you do that, then those numbers are going to be dominated by the very largest organizations in the sector. And it does, and it kind of it does obscure, I think, the fact that many much smaller organizations are are suffering a lot more than the big, uh, the big kahunas. Whose, whose whose dollar amounts are really uh, just uh, preeminent in the the totals that we're looking at. And when so, you look at the aggregate, you know, especially if you look at just the the percent of philanthropy tied to GDP over time, yeah. there isn't much change. That trend line is stable. It's. Well, it's it's almost scarily stable. I mean, I, when I first saw it, I didn't, I, I uh, couldn't, I wasn't really sure how that happened, um, how it could happen that since World War II, the the percentage of uh, GDP, um, I think inflation adjusted GDP that was being uh, donated to charity was always around two percent, almost always, you know, and then it varies, it varies somewhat over the, that time period, but it it never varies very much. It's it's always tightly bound around two percent. So things have been pretty constant for a very long time, I think. And, and as far as metrics like that are concerned in the nonprofit sector, um, and uh, and similarly, I think when you uh, when you look at the trend line that you see in uh, let's say the Giving USA report, which which has done a really effective job of tracking funding into nonprofit organizations from one major source, one of many major sources, uh, individual contributions and, in, and institutional contributions. But if you look at the grand total of money coming from those sources to nonprofit organizations, uh, the the what, what almost always happens is that uh, there's a good sized increase, you know, a, an increase of a couple percentage points in total dollars from all sources uh, before you control for inflation. And then most of the time, there's there's still a significant increase even after you control for inflation. 2021 was an exception uh, because there was a, a slight decrease um, after controlling for inflation. But A, that was because uh, that was partly because inflation was so much larger in 2021. You know, it's not a not a correction that most of us are used to paying a lot of attention to because inflation is generally, you know, wasn't that big of a deal in the previous year. Um, so it doesn't really matter if you control for it or not, really. Um, the, the other thing is that there was such a huge increase in 2020. And uh, I think a lot of people were surprised by that. But I, it looks like that was the response of a lot of people to the pandemic is to give to charity, maybe a, a give larger amounts uh, than they have been or maybe give when they hadn't been giving at all. And I think uh, th for those who expected a kind of a regression to the mean, uh, maybe a, a cooling off of, of that hot activity that we saw in 2020, we didn't really see that. You know, we saw a slight decrease, but only a slight one. On average, over the last two years, uh, the sector is still up uh, by, you know, several billion dollars in terms of contributions from individuals or organizations. Yeah, it's so interesting because, you know, you, you yeah. mentioned this idea of the many worlds that we've lived in since 2020. And, and you know, I've I've turned my perspective multiple times on how to think about the last couple of years compared to disaster response. So, mm -hmm. you know, when there's a disaster and there's a uh, hyper increase of giving over a short period of time, and then the longer you get away from that disaster, the the giving just naturally falls off. That disaster yeah. is no longer as relevant, et cetera. And so I know early on, we anticipated that the pandemic would be somewhat like that. And then we quickly saw that it was sustained. And, and you know, um, 
regardless of where you fall on pandemic to endemic at this point, et cetera, the, there has been consistency in, in giving. There hasn't been that regression to the mean that many people anticipated, like you said, from you know 2020 into 2021. At the same time, for many organizations, fundraising has gotten even more complex during that time. Yeah, I, I com complex is a very good way to describe it because it hasn't necessarily gotten harder, especially for those organizations that have done a pretty good job of moving over into the digital realm. Um, they were they were they they had something to fall back on uh, that if, that might have even been their business as usual. But for organizations that depended on getting large groups of people together and trying to convince them to to give money at fundraising events. Uh, you know, some of them have not, they still haven't gotten unstuck and trying to find a, tried to find a workaround uh, even now. Uh, I think probably most of them have, but many of them, I think, uh, re reacted to the pandemic saying, all right, well, you know, I guess we can't do what we usually do. So we'll just wait until we can do what we usually do. Um, so that's, that's, I think, part of, that, that, that's part of what we've seen. I think that, uh, um, when you and, and when, but when you talk about the sustained uh, response to the pandemic, I think uh, what you've seen is that over since the pandemic started, really, I think we've seen we haven't seen a big decline. Uh, we haven't seen a kind of a cooling off or a, um, a, a lack of um, a, a lack of willingness to to keep on contributing money into the sector. Um, the thing about that, and when you mentioned disaster response, I think uh, I have to mention a report that we published, uh, the Dugan Institute, that is, back in, uh, right around the start of the pandemic, because we wanted to take a look back at the, this history, this trend data on volunteering and, uh, and other sorts of non-monetary uh, um, contributions to civil society. Uh, for a report that we did, uh, for and, and we published the, the results on a report, we took a look back at volunteering and, uh, and other types of charitable activities um, right after 9-11 in, in New York City, right after Hurricane Katrina in uh, the New Orleans area, and right after the Great Recession nationwide. And what we found is that uh, even with giving, where we're measuring giving not by total dollars, but by the percentage of people who contribute to charity, um, over twenty-five dollars or more, we did see uh, we did see a cooling off period, even in the the most heavily affected areas. People were willing to step up and make contributions of time and money uh, right after the uh, disaster happened, and uh, for for a little bit through the recovery. But after the recovery was sort of up and um, up and running, then. Uh, in a lot of cases, participation rates dropped off to where they were before the pandemic, sometimes even lower. So that's that was our lesson from coming out of previous uh, historical um, pandemic-like events, and yeah. which is that unless people mobilize and prevent something like that from happening, the the vast majority of people who are willing to step up are, are going to do it for a little while and then kind of tail off. Yeah, yeah, and and you know so. that is certainly the effort of so many organizations uh let's say especially in the last 18 months is yeah covid donor retention like that's become a a phrase that we're very familiar with and that there are multiple different strategies and tactics that folks are taking and uh nathan what we want to do is spend some time today on an area that that you're very well versed in in the great recession and and see what we can understand as we look ahead to a potential recession understand some things from your research uh, uh, and what you, you know, as an expert on the Great Recession, um, you know, both from how long it lasted and what that might tell us or not tell us uh, about what to expect, uh, but then also, you know, just some key findings. And so g give us a flyby, a flyby, like walk us back to 2008 and uh, in the the immediate time following that so that we can kind of wrap our minds around uh, that time frame and what it meant for nonprofits so that it might help us think about this time frame and what it means for nonprofits. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I, I can I can do that. I'm going to start with uh, uh, start with kind of the broader picture of uh, nonprofit finance and then kind of zero in on individual portions of the subset of the sector to try to try to see what happened. Um, what you saw, for instance, if you look at the Giving USA results 
Um, but again, you know what what you are used to seeing when you look at the the the, the major trend in the report, which is total amount given, uh, adjusting for inflation, let's say, from all sources put together. Um, what you're used to seeing is a, a slight increase, sometimes a, a larger than slight increase, but you know occasionally a decrease. But that's not the norm. What you saw in um, uh, 2008 and 2009 were two uh, larger than average decreases in total dollar amounts controlling for inflation, and that was really extraordinary. Not be, not just because that doesn't usually happen, because decreases period don't usually happen in that particular metric, but even during recessionary periods in the giving USA time trend that goes back 40 plus years, when there is a recession, you typically don't see a decline in giving to charity by individuals or, or organizations. Um, the, the Great Recession was the exception. So I, it took us a while, I think, and this is this is true, uh, no matter what kind of uh, no matter what kind of result your empirical result you're talking about, it took us a while to see it, mainly because it, it took us a while. Uh, to get the data that would tell us what what actually was going on in the sector, but that's something that we saw right away. Uh, what we did for the NPQ article, nonprofit quarterly article, uh, was to take a look at historical data from Form 990, where organization. I mean, probably most of your audience knows this on Form 990, um, on Part Eight, organizations are reporting uh, the amount of money that they took in for revenues and support from all kinds of different sources, and that was. Uh, that's what we did. That's what we tracked when we looked at um, revenues from uh, revenues from all sources and then revenues from uh, major groupings of sources um, taken from the 990s. Again, there was a delay there. We didn't have that data uh, right away because it takes a while for the 990 for the IRS to process the 990s and make them available to analysts. Um, but that was actually helpful because when we did the analysis, we not only had the data from the Great Recession period. Uh, as well as data from before the Great Recession, but we had data for a few years after the Great Recession. So we could take a look at not just uh, which organizations took the biggest tumble during the Great Recession financially, but also which ones rebounded the rebounded the most, that did the best job of, uh, of getting back to where they were or even improving uh, their positions uh, since the, the Great Recession happened. What we saw... Uh, we, we saw a couple of things that I think were really noteworthy. One is that uh, if you look at education organizations, especially uh, higher education organizations, which is one of the, uh, which contains some of the largest organizations uh, measured by revenues or assets, whatever you prefer, uh, some of the largest organizations in the nonprofit sector, they saw uh, a big change in their revenue stream. I think they saw uh, a big decline in money that came in from uh, from program service revenues. I'm sorry, they, they saw a big decline in the uh, money that came in from uh, uh, from other other revenue sources, primarily investment income, uh, as opposed to money that comes in from contributions and money that comes in from program service revenues. Those are the three major categories that we focused on when we looked at trend data is money from contributions, money, just like giving USA, money that comes in from program service revenue or commercial activities, and money that comes in from all other sources. Um, sometimes it's membership dues for higher education institutions. Um, it's it's primarily investment income, and this was the large uh, colleges and universities with big endowments whose investments took a hit during the Great Recession. Um, that was that was uh, a big change, but what you what you see uh, what you see when you look at the trend and the uh, the shape of the revenue stream isn't really matched by a big decline in total dollars taken in by higher education institutions. You saw a decline in investment income, but you saw an accompanying accompanying increase in program service revenues and contributions that very nearly made up for that big decline. And so it's a change of the mix. It's right. It's, it's not the overall declining. It's it's just your change of a mix. Like many people are seeing a change in the mix of channel or source right now. So maybe, right. you know, as Lindsay Arrow shared with us from food banks, you saw a shift of the pie from direct mail to digital. It's similar to what you saw from the higher ed and also in the medical space as well. Yeah, also in the medical space. Although um, what you what you see in the medical space, um, what you see in the medical space is, is not nearly as, uh, you can't really tell what's going on trend-wise. You can't even really tell if you look at the revenue mix trend 
uh, and you even if you focus on the Great Recession period, you can't even tell that there was a Great Recession. Hospitals just sort of cruise through the Great Recession without without much impact. In fact, uh, I don't think they actually I don't think their revenues uh, actually declined very much at all during during the period of the Great Recession, controlling for inflation. Uh, they did for higher education institutions, not by very much, but they did uh, they did decline a little bit. Um, but uh, they actually increased, I think, for hospitals. So, um, but but the thing about what happened to hospitals and higher education institutions, the so-called eds and meds in the sector, uh, they, these are the very largest organizations in the in the uh, in the public charity space. We're not talking about private foundations. We're talking about public charity uh, public charities who spend money on programs primarily, um, as opposed to grant making. Uh, but just the, the way that the Eds and Meds survived the Great Recession and recovered from it is just very different from what happened in the rest of the sector. You saw a lot of organizations, um, a lot of organizations have much more trouble, especially uh, organizations that um, didn't have, uh, that, that had less stable sources of income coming their way. Like arts organizations had uh, a little bit harder, a little bit tougher time because their income, uh, their, their, uh, money was coming in from uh, from contributions, and not necessarily contributions from things like uh, patrons of the theater buying tickets, but contributions from institutional supporters. Uh, you know, or foundations who had a hard time spending money um, on grant making beyond the minimum during the Great Recession sometimes decided to cut the funding that they gave to arts organizations because. Uh, their investment income was a lot lower, and so they they had less to spend without cutting into the the body of money, the the corpus that they manage. Um, and then you had, uh, and then a, a third category that was really noteworthy. And there were a couple of the smaller categories, the categories with smaller organizations in them uh, tended to have worse outcomes, kind of like the arts organizations in some cases even worse. But with human services organizations. Uh, not the not at universities, not hospitals, but organizations that provide human services. That was a group of organizations. First of all, that's the biggest subsector in the nonprofit sector. More organizations in that uh, subsector than in any other. Um, but also, it's this is an organ. This is a group of organizations that, um, not exclusively, but primarily, I think, takes in most of their revenue from commercial revenues, uh, government contracts, especially. And during the Great Recession period, they just didn't, their, their revenues didn't decline at all. I think uh, just like hospitals, I think uh, controlling for inflation, uh, in, uh, re total revenues for human services organizations didn't decline during the Great Recession. And there was really nothing to recover from. So they just, uh, the the, the post-recession uh, trend uh, was actually a little bit less impressive than it was for other subsectors, but that's just because they didn't actually suffer very much. As a as a group during the recession. So Nathan, as as we're kind of you, you just described the trends we saw during the Great Recession, the larger organizations kind of remixed where their revenue was coming from. The really small organizations kind of struggled a little bit more, along with arts. And then you said the human services kind of stayed about even in the middle. Mm -hmm. As you looked ahead in the next few years. You know, moving on to 2010, 2012, 2014, how did that look in terms of things like market share and were these organizations able to then grow afterward or did things kind of stay about stable or how did that look? You had a lot of organizations like uh, human services organizations, uh, the biggest subsector that had the smallest percentage of organizations that uh, that lost a lot of assets during the recession. They had a, uh, the smallest percentage of organizations that gained uh, a significant amount of their assets back after the recession, and they had the lowest closure rates. So, you know, compare that to arts organizations, which had a uh, uh, which also, for the most part, didn't close. They were less likely to close, but they were more likely to lose a lot of assets during the recession and less likely to be big winners. So even though they didn't go bankrupt typically uh, during the Great Recession, and uh, they they came out of the Great Recession in worse financial shape than they uh, than they went in than before the recession started. So, but they were better off than the smaller organizational types that I was talking about earlier. So. Yeah, you know, with those small organizations, um, 
I know it's relative, but but at least I I theorize that so that many of those, you know, maybe their individual giving was heavily weighted towards a small number of high wealth donors, and Could so be. when those small number of high wealth donors when they have to pull back, then all of a sudden it depletes the funding for the nonprofit as a whole. And so I can at least see that cycle play out. And it's one of the reasons why we talk about how there is health in diversity amongst your donor pyramid, right? So, you know, obviously having a wide base of mass market donors and then, you know, a strong base of those middle donors and then up to the major donors. And then obviously your, your kind of legacy giving, corporate giving, uh, and and foundation giving at the top. Um, your research also indicated that there are those that increase their revenue post recession, uh, after the Great Recession, uh, and that kind of thrived somewhat during it even. So talk a little bit about that um, that resiliency. Yeah, I can. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk some about resiliency, but I'll also talk about organizations that just uh, didn't really suffer during the <laughs> during the Great Recession. Like, uh, um, I think the the two major categories of organizations that didn't uh, that that didn't even see a, a decline in their in the total assets that they controlled are hospitals and human services organizations. Hospitals because they were just so big, you know, and they didn't have a they didn't have money coming in that was uh, that was really jeopardized by the Great Recession. Program service revenues, but I think people don't I think people don't realize this, especially if you look at something like Giving USA. But human services organizations are kind of smaller versions of that business model. You don't see that in Giving USA because you don't have commercial revenues measured with Giving USA. You have giving from people and from institutions. So, and and thus you're missing a big chunk of money that that comes in from uh, um, that comes in from other sources into the sector. So, uh, that's those I think are the biggest uh, the biggest differences. When you look at revenues, then you do see uh, um, you actually see. Uh, um, a couple of other organization organization types like health organizations, not including hospitals, actually saw uh, an increase in their revenues, controlling for inflation. Um, and you saw a couple of organiz couple of organizational types that didn't really, you know, didn't really suffer very much. Um, like uh, actually, a couple of the smaller ones, like uh, international organizations and membership benefit organizations, uh, they didn't. Even though they're they're very contribution heavy in their revenue streams, they actually didn't have uh, uh, they didn't suffer very much during the Great Recession. So it's funny. I think uh, it, it's so it's not the case. In other words, that uh, during a Great Recession, if your income stream is very heavily weighted toward contributions from individuals or from institutions, that the subsector tended to suffer. Um, but I think that that's one big that's likely to be one big difference between that recessionary period and the one that we might be heading into is that I think this is where inflation really matters a lot more. I've heard people talk about this especially when it comes to uh uh when when it comes to monthly givers, you know that that's been the trend in the sector as especially in the fundraising world is to try to convince people to give on a monthly basis, just set it up so that the money comes automatically out of your account. I think that uh um, people are coming back, uh, donors are coming back to fundraisers now and saying, this is this is going to kill me, but I just, I need to cut way down on the amount that I'm giving on a monthly basis, or I need to, I need to cancel the monthly payments because things just cost too much. And uh, that's something that, you know, I, I think that the, the, the value uh, and the, the huge benefit to fund to the fundraising world of monthly giving is that you know you can get people set up so that they don't have to you don't have to go after them every you know on a regular basis to try to get them to uh, convince them to give more but um now i think that uh that that's that's work that fundraisers are going to have to do uh because of inflation um once once things kind of stabilize a little bit they're going to have to go back to those people and say okay we now we really need you so can you is it possible for you to restart get us back to where we were so then if we're looking at the lessons that we learned from the Great Recession, and you're just kind of talking about this, applying them going forward into the possibility of the next recession, what sort of things what sort of things can we lean on 
that you could tell nonprofits, hey, start getting your ducks in a row now for looking at these things. Um, you know, certainly <laughs> resiliency and, and diversity of revenue. Um, is there anything else that they should be doing now in preparation? Yeah, um, that's. This is a great question, and this actually this took me back not to the things that I've uh, done research on, but the the things that we talk about when I teach my class, because people do want to know about uh, how to how to how to ensure the ongoing financial health of the nonprofit organizations, especially if they work for one or if they run one. I've got a lot of entrepreneurs in my classes. Um, I think the 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 thing that nonprofit organizations have come, you know. I think there are differences of opinion about what things are most important for nonprofits, but I think that what's most important for nonprofits is uh, what, what's most important for for-profit organizations, according to people like Warren Buffett, and that's positive cash flow. Uh, that's it, organizations can grow, uh, and nonprofits know this. You can grow your asset base without actually taking in cash. If uh, um, if you if you take in uh, receivables, uh, just and uh, and take in assets that are uh, that are just valued on paper, uh, like capital assets. Those are the types of things where it make the balance sheet look good for your organization. But uh, when when push comes to shove and you really need money to pay for things, uh, and you're not and because you don't have very many other options but to pay for things with money, then positive cash flow is just a uh, there. There's no substitute for it. There's nothing. Nothing that's as good as having positive cash flow um, from program operations. I mean, you can always get cash from borrowing, which is not a long-term strategy, and you can get money. Uh, uh, you can get money from selling your long-term assets, but that's not a long-term strategy either. You need to have profitable uh, program operations that bring in positive cash flow. So, for organizations that might have a, um, that that might have been kind of hesitating before uh, so let's say moving into the digital world to try to uh, uh, try to establish their own presence there i would say you know that this this would probably be a good time to start doing it uh before now would have been probably a better time to start doing it but better late than never because um they can they can probably do something like business as usual going back to some of that as a uh, um as as the the worst of the pandemic starts to recede, they can start uh, getting used to these new models of fundraising and engaging with donors. So that'll help. You know, I think just uh, uh, they'll help organizations get through periods where maybe they didn't have much, if any, cash flow because they weren't going out and soliciting funds. Um, but I think organizations uh, organizations can probably uh, um, they. Uh, it, it's probably a good idea to, uh, um, uh, well, I'm actually going to double back on this. I've been thinking a lot about what they should do if they do get a lot of money. Uh, I was, I, I think that um, uh, taking a uh, borrowing money is probably not uh, probably not the best idea, especially if interest rates are going to continue to go up. I mean, that's something that uh, um, that's something that nonprofit organizations sometimes have a hard time doing anyway is borrowing money because they just don't have the access to capital markets. Uh, I hope that changes because nonprofit organizations can, um, can pay attention to, uh, can, can uh, hopefully get, get a little bit more of a break during a period like this than, than maybe they typically do. But, uh, but even if they do find lenders who are willing to lend to them, they're probably not going to find very favorable interest rates. Um, the other thing that nonprofit organizations can think about is the fact that uh, a, a lot of the uh, um, a lot of the recovery uh, legislation that's been passed by Congress is is scheduled to flow money down to state and local governments. And when that happens, I don't think it's happened for the most part yet. But when that does happen, uh, that is money that nonprofit they usually go straight to nonprofit organizations. You know the uh, state and local governments don't spend it running their own programs or providing their own services. They hire nonprofit organizations to do that. So maybe organizations that don't typically do that type of work should you know check the R, uh, uh, request for funding proposals um, that are published in government sources because there might be ways for them to take in more money. Um, money from additional sources that maybe they don't tap into ordinarily. It's such a uh, interesting and and uh, and it's it's somewhat out of our purview, Nathan. 
uh, you yeah. know, as, as as outsourced fundraising uh, professionals that that we don't uh, necessarily consider. And so I appreciate you bringing that perspective. And and just to touch on the idea that you said about you know just having a, a healthy cash flow now, um, I interpret that as um, as continuing to invest in growth. And so that's coming from diversified sources and diversified approaches. Uh, and that even though this world uh, is increasingly more complex, that it is worth the complex for the stability of diversified revenue sources, even amongst your individual giving, uh, you know, pipe and, uh, and, and section of your donor pyramid, because, you know, as you said, it's in times of uh, increased, let's say increased stress, uh, you know, global stress, whether or not that's economic uncertainty or uh, macro health uncertainty, or even in the wake of a disaster. It's those times when nonprofits are, are many times needed the most. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that we regularly say to our clients and we want our listening audience to hear is, it's not a time to pull back. You right. have a need. You need to ask. Don't stop asking. Make your asks even more authentic and find diverse ways to to make your ask. As you said, you know, that resiliency and pivoting and uh, and considering new sources, even even if it is through, you know, government oriented contracts, et cetera. Um, and additional grants that are going to be out there during this time. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I think that um, I was really heartened when I saw the new nonprofit finance fund report because they talked about the fact that uh, something almost, I think almost half of organizations, uh, let me make sure I get this right. I think it's over, over a third of nonprofit organizations said that 50% uh, or more of the funding that they've been receiving during the pandemic has been unrestricted like un unrestricted period. So that's fantastic. I think that, and there are a lot of stories that accompany that from people who say, you know, that's actually been our experience. We, uh, our, our foundation funders have been putting a lot fewer strings on the money that they give us because they know that everybody's struggling. And so that's fantastic. You know, that that's the type of thing where, um, that that's something that you hope continues because the the recovery is not going to be instantaneous and organizations are still going to be uh, still going to be struggling. Um, when it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, uh, the idea of investing in growth, though, that's where uh, that, that I'm just going back to my experience in class. When I say investing in growth, when I tell my students about that, what I mean is taking money that you have and investing in capital assets like you know buildings or upgrades of equipment and things like that. And I think now is probably not a great time to do that if you have to borrow, uh, even though it's the type of thing that traditionally will help your organization grow um, by increasing its capacity. I think what organizations can do is just prepare for growth. You know, look around, keep their eyes open uh, and uh, be attuned and attentive to opportunities to tap into revenue sources that maybe they hadn't considered in the past. I think it's very well said. Uh, you know, the the past is prologue, uh, and so you know there are things that we can learn, and uh, and and certainly take away from uh, many of our most recent experiences, and and even you know not even going back as far as the Great Recession. Uh, you know, uh, a a modern nonprofit decision maker should be adept at pivoting. <laughs> at this point, we've been pivoting. You know, mm -hmm. like Carl Malone down on the block since uh, since March 2020. Uh, that is a deep cut of an NBA throwback for uh, for our listener audience. Um, so, uh, but anyway, you know, and, and Nathan, I think you you hit on some very important aspects of of the, you know the reality of the resiliency of both nonprofits and of donors the reality of the overall ebbs and flows of the percent of giving and how in some cases it may change in terms of the um, the slices of the pie and the size of the slices in other cases it may change you know more or less favorably depending on the size of the organization and um, the stability that you have and some of that is tied to 
your overall cash flow and, and how you're financially structured today. And mm -hmm. so I think there are a lot of great lessons in there. Um, as we as we wrap up, if uh, if folks want to uh, get in touch with you, learn more about the uh, the institute, learn more about the research that you and the team are conducting, where's the best uh, where's the best place to find you? Well, I'm a uh, the the best place to find me, and uh, if I can, uh, I think you mentioned a place where we can put URLs, so. Uh, we can do that. My my email address is uh, is N Dietz. That's just a uh, man is in Nathan D I E T Z at umd dot edu. But uh, I'll send you a, uh, I'll send you a link to the Duguid Institute's webpage, and there's a research section where people can find out more about the work I do. But really, it's a, it's also a great way to find out more about the institute itself, because uh, that the the work of the institute, the Duguid Institute is to teach our students. There are many, many, many students here at the College Park campus uh, how, to, how to look for and capitalize on opportunities to do good. Uh, the idea of the Do Good, the name Do Good Institute comes from the, the Do Good Challenge, which is a competition among social entrepreneurs, student social entrepreneur teams who compete for a little pot of venture capital at the end of every school year. And that, that's been such a popular event that we changed the name of the center uh, to the Do Good Institute after the Do Good Challenge. So the the research that we've been talking about is just a, it's kind of background information for the work that we do as, as our main line of business. We teach students how to get out there and make the most of their passion for doing good uh, by capitalizing on opportunities to do that. And uh, the research just gives them a better idea of what to expect when they start doing it themselves. I absolutely love it, Nathan. And uh, and yeah, please send us over that link. We'll make sure that that's also included in all of our notes about the show. And and we'll encourage folks to go there. And and again, just want to uh, say thank you for your time and and you sharing some of these lessons and uh, snapshots of what we've seen in the past. And we know that you and the team are are staying on top of current uh, trends. And so we're going to be looking for more great information from you and and other. Uh, researchers at the Institute in the uh, the days to come. Now, thank you, Ronnie. Thank you, Justin. Uh, I won't say it wasn't exactly fun to talk about a recession than a pandemic, <laughs> but uh, but I enjoyed this. I think it's important to, you know, just understand what we can about where we are. I completely agree. And, uh, you know, I'd be lying if if I told you that you weren't the first person to say that they didn't have fun with us. So that's okay. We, we <laughs> I didn't, okay. know. I didn't mean it that way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, if you like this episode of Group Thinkers, uh, be sure to give us a review on wherever you're listening to the podcast, or if you're listening with your eyes on YouTube, which some people do as well. Uh, be sure to give us a review on this episode. You can always subscribe, check out all of our previous episodes, and uh, we uh, are so thankful for uh, for our listening audience and those that tune in. Ronnie, what have I missed? I think you covered it all. I, I mean, it was great to hear this because, you know, it's often said that history is our greatest teacher. So hearing what has happened before and kind of applying that to the road ahead, it sounds like, sure, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but most organizations are going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it takes staying on top of it. You got to be able to navigate. You got to be able to Indiana Jones your way through life, and so that's uh, that's how we're we're gonna handle it. So, uh, thanks everybody for tuning to this episode. Be sure to be on the lookout uh, as we go through, you know, the next couple of episodes, uh, talking about various aspects of uncertainty, and uh, and we look forward to those conversations. All right, we'll uh, we'll see you next time. See you down the road.